Amen. Thank you for joining me. Today we're addressing a serious topic, and that is what's going on in the world today. <laughs> I mean, how are things going? You know, are they going good? Are they not going good? There was an incident uh, in Philadelphia, and I had been so busy with work, I didn't hear about this probably until Thursday or Friday. It happened Tuesday. And so there was a legitimate protest over a verdict over a separate case of something happening where people felt injustice was, was done. And then there was looting later on, uh, of, of, I don't know, many, many people of, uh, many businesses, big businesses like the Apple store and businesses in the mall to pharmacies, to small businesses. I even saw a little local t-shirt shop getting busted into, and people are looting, rioting. They're breaking the glass. There's surveillance video all over the internet of these people going in and taking things that, that aren't theirs, stealing. Um, man, I mean, they broke broke into an uh, electronic store, kind of like Best Buy, a PC Richardson or something like that. Uh, man, they stole TVs and computers and anything they could. And uh, Apple Store, look at the footage for the Apple Store. It's crazy. There's people just mobbing it, stealing things left, right, and center. It was awful. And they've arrested, I think, over 60 people now, and they're still going. And, you know, when you look at, number one, the circumstance, like how does that happen in a country like ours? And number two, you look at the people involved in it, all, many, many younger folks say, so what happened to our youth? And then you look at the fact that it's not even the biggest headline in the news anymore because it's happened in San Francisco. It's happened uh, in this place and that place and at this time and that time, and it will happen again. So it's not even a surprise anymore. And look at it in the context of modern day um, business. You know, you, it seems like every other story that comes up on my uh, news feed that I have on my phone uh, is about these stores getting robbed. You know, that these stores are getting robbed so much. I think it was the president of Rite Aid, a big chain of pharmacies, kind of like a CVS. He said, we're getting to the point where we're going to have to put every single item behind a case in the whole store. Uh, my wife and I, I told this story before when I was preaching on a message not too long ago. My wife and I, about a month ago, I think it was, went to the beach. Uh, I think it was a very short trip. And we were at the grocery store near the beach uh, in South Carolina, uh, I want to say um, outside of Charleston, South Carolina, and we were at a, a grocery store and on the conveyor belt there where you go to check out, they had a, a box, a secure box with a bottle of soap in it. And my wife just pointed it and I just shook my head like, you guys got to lock up the soap. You know, everything, Rite Aid has to put everything behind uh, a cage. Uh, you, there's, I saw a, a footage, and I'm not seeking this stuff out, okay? Uh, if you know me, you know that I actually try to avoid a lot of the news because it is so depressing, and I don't want to get wound up. But, man, I mean, there's a story about Home Depot and how bad it's got at Home Depot. Uh, matter of fact, a, a uh, senior individual was checking, just wanted to check someone's receipt. And he was hit so hard as this thief ran out of the store that he hit his head on one of the, uh, contraptions at the store, one of the poles at the store and he died. And that's a, that's a North Carolinian right there. And uh, home Depot's having to lock stuff up and everybody's locking stuff up. It's getting really, really bad. And the question is how long, you know, I've talked to folks my age, and I'm 43, praise God, I'll be 44 in January, and I've talked to folks my age how we would just go, like, you know, at, at during the day when we were kids, uh, you know, weekend or after school, we could just go, like, you know, just go into town or go to the field, and just come home whenever. And now would we dare do that with our children? No. Does that make us some kind of special parent? No, we're just like everyone else. People aren't letting their kids out of their sight because things have gotten so bad. Things have gotten so bad. And the question is, how long? How long is it going to go on like this? How long is it going to be this bad? And the answer is, we don't know. But I believe the Bible gives us some hints about how long it's going to be and what we're seeing right here. And so the text verse here, 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4, very short verse, very powerful verse, a passage of scripture. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, 
saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. We see here scoffers, the idea of unbelief in our society at large. People don't believe. If man feared God, man would stay far away from doing something that's so blatantly criminal, right? What has happened? The idea of unbelief in our society at large, Hebrews 11, 6 through 7. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And you know Hebrews 11 is often called the Hebrews Hall of Heroes or Hall of Fame or whatever it may you want to call it. And here we have Noah, and here we have it being told that he had faith. And by the way, who believed in Noah's time? It was just Noah, right? So you think of millions or even billions on the earth at that time, and it was Noah and his family and his, his son's wives that were saved. That's it. That group of people, that small group of people. You know, think about that. If you ask yourself, okay, how many people were on the ark, right? If you ask yourself, how many people were on Noah's ark? It wasn't many. It wasn't five families. It wasn't 10 families. Amen. You know, it wasn't a dozen. It wasn't two dozen. Eight people. Eight people out of all humanity and the rest were wiped out. And so you, you can say a loving God wouldn't allow everyone to walk around ignorant. Well, it happened then. It can happen now. And they don't have faith in God. And we see here the operative word. There's a few in Hebrews 11, 6 or 7. One being, uh, um, you must believe, right? So I should say phrase, the operative phrase. Uh, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, okay? We have to believe he is. He's rewarded of them that diligently seek him. And the other one is fear. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of the things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. We are to fear God. And I'm not picking on the group because I believe there are many older folks that, that, that don't reverence or fear God, but certainly young folks today aren't fearing the Lord. Amen. And you look and you say, well, how can you judge? Well, I'm just, I was just looking at their mug shots and they all look like they could be in high school. Okay. Or college, the young kids. Amen. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about that. Children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Ephesians 6, 1. By the way, one person that helped organize this thing was apparently a social media influencer, and her grandma said, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. Grandma's ashamed, and the child is emboldened. And that is how, how we're seeing the young folks say, Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. I was at a sports game not long ago. I saw a player walk off the field while everyone else shook each other's hands. You know, if I did that when I was playing sports, which wasn't that long ago, I'd probably be dismissed from the team. And this kid just goes and sulks in the stands. Unbelievable what we're dealing with. Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. I know some people in law enforcement and they tell me it has never been this bad ever, especially with young folks and being rebellious and not obeying authority. And the reason why I keep reading verses about obeying your parents is they weren't listening to mom and dad or mom and dad weren't around. And now they're not listening to any other authority. Matthew 15, 4, for God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. That's Matthew 15, 4. Proverbs 1, 8, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Ephesians 6, 1, uh, 1 here, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Again, I read that before. Uh, Exodus 20, Verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Proverbs 13, 24, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes, or many times. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will depart, he will not depart from it. Okay. The reason why, and there's more verses I could read, but the reason why I'm harping on these, vo- on these verses is because 
maybe there was nobody home to instruct some of these young folks to stay off of social media, number one. We don't allow it in our house, and we've got older kids here, and we don't allow it. Now, I'm sure they find a little something that's somewhat like social media, but we, we, don't, we don't allow it. So number one, I've been preaching this for years, you, know, you really consider getting off these social networks. They're, they're, they're really dangerous. Uh, number two, listen to your parents. And if you don't listen to your parents, then there's consequences. And that's very unpopular, you know, to institute consequences. And then number three, as you institute consequences, hold fast to them and teach them that this is because you love them and you want them to behave well, you know, and this is just a little extra. But as a parent of three children, I know what it's like to see disobedience in the household. And I know that I won't tolerate, mom won't tolerate it, and there are consequences uh, to their actions. And these children won't know there's consequences until they're arrested, until maybe many years later. And yes, I'm on my soapbox here, but no, I, I don't, I'm not any better. I was one of the bad, wild children out there. I shouldn't say bad. They're, I'm sure the kids are just kids, but I was wild and I was getting into everything and it didn't take, you know, uh, any kind of suggestion. I was willing to do it all my own. But the difference is, or the similarity is, there was no one there helping me understand these verses, preaching these verses, having Proverbs or family altar time, insisting that I go to church, insisting that I get into God's word. But instead, what we see, instead of having this reverence to God's word, like, okay, this is true and we must adhere to it, we have a rebellion of God's word. We have no faith in God. We, have, we don't fear God as a society and as young people. And we have this great perversion creeping in with these worldly ideas and worldly ways, amen, that, that, that somehow they're able in their minds to justify smashing a window out, robbing a store blind, and then feeling like they're a victim if they get arrested, if they could even be arrested because our society's moved away from taking, you know, having law enforcement out there, which the Bible says those folks are there to keep peace and to help keep evil away. The actions of others, their lives tell a story of unbelief, just like the times of Noah. And so when you say, how long, ask yourself, what's going on in society today? And you see rank unbelief. You see people acting as if God would not judge them. Surely some of those folks that robbed these stores and looted would not do it if they knew they'd have to answer to a holy, sovereign, all-powerful God sooner than they might think. Matthew 24, 37 through 39, Jesus addresses this issue as well. But as the day of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also, be, also the coming of the Son of Man be. And so Jesus is letting us know, it's just as in the time of Noah, when people were stunned that there was such a thing called rain and the water accumulation and then a flood and then a deep flood and then a flood that they could not bear. And then they were, it was too late. You know, at that point they're calling out to God and it's too late. It's too late. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? I've researched this and man may not know, but it was many, many years. And that ark was a testimony to God and the safety that God provides all could, you know, it's a massive structure all could uh, see it being built. I always marvel at the picture of the ark uh, there in Kentucky, in William Williamstown, Kentucky, by Answers in Genesis. And we were fortunate enough to visit last year. And I stood afar off and just looked at it. And I imagined that just in a field somewhere and everybody around looking and seeing that thing built. And yet nobody believed, nobody. And here we are with all this truth, this rich truth in the Bible, all of this gold in the Bible, all of this preaching available online and Bible studies available online, all these resources and a church practically on every corner, at least here in the South. And yet nobody is behaving right. And I say nobody loosely. Yes, I know some folks are in church and stuff, but that's rare. That's the exception. Amen. I just did a message recently about how these churches are practically empty you know, all of this plays into the idea, how long is it going to be? And if Jesus tells us the coming of the Son of Man will be as everybody living in unbelief as they were in Noah's time, 
and we see all of this happening here, then we could probably reconcile the coming of the Son of Man is very soon. Okay? And I'll get to some unique points with that as well in a minute. But when you look at it, and I look at it, and I say, okay, my wife, for example, she would look at something in Philadelphia, and we were talking about it, and she'd say, oh, then it's, you know, if it happened in Philly, because I told her uh, my dad worked in Philly for years, and I used to go visit in Philadelphia to visit my dad, uh, because my parents were divorced, and I'd go visit my dad on weekends in the summer. And I said Philadelphia was, was or is a great town, just salt of the earth people. Uh, yes, it's a city, but it's, it's kind of like a Charlotte or a D.C. or something like that. It's it's a great place. It's a fun place. It's a historical place. And she looked at me and said, okay, it's going to happen in Charlotte then too. you know." And so you say, how long till this comes knocking on our door? Well, sooner than we might think. But the other way to look at it is, is how long till the Lord comes? Sooner than we might think. Walking after their own lusts, contrary to how the Christian is called to live and act. So we see people walking after their own lusts. And I'm going to read a little bit from 2 Timothy 3 here, starting at verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Let's just stop there. When you do something like stealing from someone else, you are taking what's not yours away from another. And if you spent time having empathy for the other, you would never want to do that, right? If you really focused on that other person and not yourself, and you love them more than you loved you, then you would never want to do that. Covetous, you know, oh, I'm stealing from the Apple store. Why? What is it that you want there? What is it that you think that stealing from there will complete who you are as a person? Boasters, proud, the opposite of humility is pride. And God hates a proud look, amen. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Again, the ringleader of at least some of this looting, grandma helped raise her, so it's like a parent, said, I'm ashamed because she knows better and she's a good kid and she shouldn't have done any of this and she did. And surely grandma maybe had warned her in the past Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Wow. Without natural affection, they don't have love in their hearts. Truce breakers, they're breaking the law. I think I'm seeing that. False accusers, they're lying, cheating, and stealing to get out of it if they can. I've already read a story where the attorney of one of one of the looters is saying that they that that uh, people are being racist towards them or this or that. They're already trying to get out of it. False accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Now, how about this? And I know not everyone in law enforcement is perfect, but generally you get into that field because you want to help. You know, they call them first responders because they're the first one running to a problem when most people are running away. Uh, the few people that I know in law enforcement, I know a few of them, they genuinely, you know, have good, loving hearts. I, you know, I think of a young man named Devin. You went to church with Devin for years. When I had a little coffee shop, he worked in there for a season. He's just the sweetest kid in the world. He wanted to go Navy or Army or something, didn't quite pan out, and became an officer of the law, you know, and he was proud he is proud to do that. I believe he's still in the force. He's proud to do it. He's, he loves people. He's, I don't think he's, you know, in my mind, I don't think he's got a bad bone in his body. He's a sweet kid, you know, despisers of those that are good. So someone like that, now all of a sudden the looter despises these people. There's videos of the looters fighting and brawling with the police and stuff. It's crazy. Traitors in my mind, you know, they could be that heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, why would that apply? Well, if you love God, you're in his word. If you're in his word, you understand a little bit better about sin and right and wrong. And if you love God, then you may have a desire to go out with the crowd and be part of this episode, but you love God so much, you'll deny yourself that pleasure. For example, Pennsylvania or Philadelphia in at large apparently had to close all the liquor stores, at least all the state run liquor stores the next day. Now, they could just leave them closed if it's up to me, but they had to close them the next day because a lot of those got looted. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And the Bible says we all have some light in us. Amen. For the, of this sort 
are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, ever learning, think of this. We have the most educated society we've ever had. I believe I can make that statement on statistics and facts that are public and available. I've preached this some years ago about how the cell phone is more powerful, the modern cell phone is more powerful than the computers they're using in spaceships, you know, 10, 20 years ago. That, uh, you know, the college, access to college or that college degrees and education has never been higher. And so we have here 2 Timothy verse 3, dealing with the last days, ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. We have people that are very smart, very wise, very intelligent. Again, to me, it's unbelievable. Uh, they're able to break into these stores and steal these things. And it's it's insane what they can do. I was taking money out at an ATM and uh, there was a sign that said, this ATM is double hitch locked and had a picture of like a truck driving away with a chain. It said, don't even try it or don't risk it. And I'm thinking, yeah, like who would know how to, you know, if, if you were to able to get an ATM off of its concrete foundation or whatever, what are you going to do with it? It's just a metal box there, you know, but apparently people are so learned and so smart. They know how to like hack into these things to the point where they have to put a warning sign on the ATMs, which by the way, why would they have to put a warning sign on the ATMs if they weren't having this issue? Another example of just crazy looting and criminality in our society today. Uh, now Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You know, we need to be careful that we are not living a life of flirting with sin or, or having one foot in the world or flirting this idea of being popular on social media, that God doesn't give us over to this reprobate mind, allow us to live, having our conscience seared like a hot iron, allowing us to live in sin without truly understanding or having a fear for who God is. Amen. One of my prayers every day is, Lord, stay close. You know, that is, I'm praying about my family. I'm praying about work. I'm praying about teaching the kids. I'm praying about the ministry. I'm praying for this loved one and this person and this thing and that thing. And then I, I wrap it up. Lord, Lord, please stay close. Stay close. Please, God, stay close. And what I mean by that is protect me, help me, keep me on that narrow path, help me to understand, give me discernment over these things, these temptations, these distractions, these snares, these problems. Don't let me get yoked up in the things of this world. Stay close, Lord. That's how we have to pray because we are in the last days. What does God require of his people? You know, these folks are walking after their own lusts and God says, what? It's his will, not ours. You know, Jesus Christ has to suffer death for all humanity, sin, past, present, and future. He has to drink from that bitter cup of sin. And what does he do? He prays, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, Lord, but thine. The most excruciating circumstance man has ever had to deal with, he says, God, if it's your will, let it be done. Are we willing to say every day, Lord, I surrender to you. If it's your will, let it be done. That takes courage, right? That takes courage. That takes, that takes faith. And that takes a, a type of, of surrender to God that is not half-hearted. Amen. And when we pray to God that his will be done, He's going to take those lusts that burn within inside of us, and he's going to throw them so far away from us that we can't even see them. So stealing, a lust, a desire for something that's not rightfully ours, would be the last thing from our mind if we are praying to God, Lord, let your will be done. Lord, God literally said, this isn't complicated stuff, guys. God literally says in the Bible, thou shall not steal, okay? It's, it's one of the commandments. It is set in stone, if you will, Okay. When people steal, that is a sin. When people are stealing and stealing more, that sin is more and more prevalent. It's emblematic of the world that we live in and the fact that people are walking after their own lusts, contrary to how they're called. And so let's say someone were to be involved in the looting on on Tuesday and be in church on Sunday, and on Sunday they're professing they love God, but on Tuesday they were stealing, and then they've got someone snowed thinking that, hey, they're living for God. Well, their actions are showing that they are part of the last day's time when they are going afar off from God. You know, you might have someone say, I don't need to be in church. I don't need to uh, serve God. I don't need to uh, witness. I don't need to 
do all these things, right? Well, all of a sudden, we are walking after our own lusts, our own desires. And I'll say this example, and I'll move on. We live out in the country, and you see RVs and campers and stuff everywhere. Maybe the Lord will give us one one day. I won't be mad about it if he does. But can't let that camper, whatever it may be, take the place of living for God. And so you may look at these thieves and say, that's awful, that's horrendous. But then you may also say, well, I, I, I'd i rather just take my camper to the lake than go soul winning on Saturday. Or I'd rather just, you know, take my camper to the mountains rather than be at church for Sunday school on Sunday or at service on Sunday or Sunday night. You see, not my will, but thy will. And the great irony of this is as we sacrifice, as we live for God and we get rid of the lusts of our heart, whether they be stealing, whether they be idols, whether it be anything else, what we're doing is gaining peace, gaining wisdom, gaining a purpose. And so while it looks like we are losing, we're actually gaining. But where does this all end? Where is the reforming of this person? They're stealing because they have no, no, no reforming. How can they have someone, let's take the young folks for example, how can they have someone to help reform them if there's nobody in church to even reach out to them or if the church won't reach out to them? How can they, you know, how can they hear if they don't have a preacher? And how, you know, how can they read the word if they're never given the word? I believe we are in the very end of the last days because things have gotten this bad and there is no reforming. All things continue as they were. That's what Jesus said about Noah's time. They were just going on like they were. Hey, just fix the door, pile back up the shelves, sing Kumbaya, and let's move right along. All things just going as they were. How many times lately have we heard or seen or thought, never in my lifetime have I dot, dot, dot. It's got to be over 10 times that, that I've had that conversation with my wife or even myself or with God. You know, never in my lifetime have I seen the quarantine that came about from COVID. Never in my lifetime have I seen the falling away at the church, not just of the lack of attendance, but also in what's being preached from the pulpit. Never have I seen it this bad. Never. Never in my lifetime have I seen the rampant crime. And by the way, one of the kind of Ugly subplots of it is the the inequality. And so one reason why people, especially young people, may be mad is because you have someone exceptionally rich and you have a lot of folks that can barely get a job or when they do, they're not able to really feed their family because of inflation or whatever it may be. So there's rampant inequality. And you can say, well, Brother Clark, there's always been that way. Yes and no. And if you look in America, it's getting worse. Again, never in my lifetime have I seen both, again, this abundant access to knowledge. I mean, for example, um, five years ago, for example, we didn't have the kind of complex artificial intelligence we have now. These things are, you know, these tools are pretty crazy. I mean, they're, and they're pretty smart. They're getting smarter. So five years ago, we didn't have it. Three three years ago, we didn't have it. And you could take so many examples. We have great inflation. Again, I mean, I'm only 43, but never in my lifetime have I seen this kind of uh, inflation, um, this kind of just apathy among young folks, amen, uh, to- especially towards the things and ways of God. It's time to take a stand against this thinking. It's time to call these days what they are. We are in the very end of the last days. And it's time to just call it out and say, how long? Not much longer. And what does that mean? That means we need Jesus Christ. I want you to think of this. Imagine you were trying to tell others about Jesus, and the closer that he got to coming back, the closer you got to the wall behind you, okay? So you started out a little bit away, and as you were telling others about Jesus, you you know, you're kind of moving back and back because, you know, they're pressing in and the crowd is getting greater of unbelievers or whatever it may be. And now the back, the wall is getting closer and closer. When, When you touch that wall, he's returning. Well, I would say that in that instance, your feet are a half an inch, your body's a half an inch away from touching that wall. We're at the very end. We're at the very end. You know, our our backs may seem to be up against the wall. We may seem as those that love the Lord, as peculiar, as unique, as going against the tide, and that those all would be true. And we may seem like 
we are call, you know, trying to ruin someone's fun or trying to, you know, be morally superior. Well, that's also true because we are ruining someone's fun probably. And the Bible is morally superior to anything else there out there on earth. Amen. How do you think we got our laws? You know, don't listen to what people say, read the laws and then read the Bible and you'll see where we got a lot of our laws from. We need to rejoice that Jesus is coming soon. Christ is willing and able to change the heart of man. There is still time to repent. There is still time. As of the recording of this message, the Lord has not come back yet. There is still time to get right with God. And for the worst one in that looting, God would be happy and rejoice over their salvation and rejoice over their repentance. And he is willing to forgive them of all their sins, to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Not only that, but to work a new spirit in their heart. Amen. And not only that, but to help them to use them as a tool to win others to him to use them as a testimony. God's incredible. His love is incredible. As I mentioned, I was a bad kid. I was in trouble and so forth. If God can use me, he can use you. He can use even, again, the worst of the worst. So that's a one reason to rejoice. Secondly, Christians can rejoice that we are this much closer to heaven, that we can see the day clearly, that there is a point where we will say, I've never seen, I've never seen, I've never seen, and the trumpet will sound. Eventually, it's over. Amen. All the signs of the time have come to fruition. They are here now. So we can rejoice that God is coming soon and God is the judge and all things will be made right. Amen. And we will be with him for an eternity and we will have our resurrected body and everything will be perfect and there'll be no sickness and and no no, uh, sin and, and no sadness and no problems and no fleshly desires and no temptation and all these things will be made right and we will have bliss with Jesus for an eternity. We can rejoice that that is coming very soon and that time is relative, that God is still sovereign and in full control. Think about that. You say, well, why, if God's in full control, why would he allow this? Well, think about it this way. If he's about to come back, this could be one way to get people's attention that's very effective. You see, God's in full control. Stop thinking on when and start thinking on who. And rejoice in the who, and that who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who shortly will return. So the time is at hand. How much longer will it last? I don't believe too much longer because I believe the Lord's coming back. And as we think of God, sovereign God, allowing this to happen, and we reckon in our minds or reconcile in our minds, why would this happen? We can say it happens because it is fulfilling what has already been written in the Bible. And it's a testament that we are living in the very end of the last days, and he is about to return So we should rejoice and do our very best, our level best, to let people know what thus saith the word of God, that he is a good God, a merciful God, and he is willing to save the lost. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless and amen.